150 people lost their lives last week in one of the worst airline disasters of recent years. This man committed an act of mass murder. He probably didn't even hear the banging on the door. All he knew was what he was doing and what was about to happen. Who was co-pilot Andreas Lubitz, the man who deliberately crashed an airliner? And why did he do it? I've been on the hunt for clues. This was pre-planned. It wasn't impulsive. And in today's fiercely competitive airline industry, are the stresses and strains on our pilots just too much? Are onboard safety procedures tough enough? They're closing the stable door and the horses in the next field is really nice. And 150 lives have been lost. Tonight we ask, just how safe are our planes? on Tuesday morning, just over a week ago at Barcelona Airport. This is where German Wings flight 4U9525 began its final journey. It took off just after 10 o'clock with 150 people on board. German Wings is the low-budget subsidiary of Lufthansa, Germany's national carrier. This should have been a short 90-minute hop across the Alps to Dusseldorf. But it was a flight that would never reach its destination. At around 10.30, the plane reached its cruising altitude of 38,000 feet. But only a minute later, air traffic control became aware of a potential problem. The plane started a rapid descent. And then... Nothing. Strangely, there was no mayday or distress signal. There had been radio silence for the previous 10 minutes. Air traffic control could see that the plane had lost over 30,000 feet in 10 minutes, and that it hadn't changed course when heading for a mountain at over 400 miles per hour. Controllers on the ground knew that the plane was not responding, but they didn't know why. We're getting reports uh, from AFP and also from Reuters that there has been a plane crash in the south of France. The dreadful news of an accident emerged within hours. Air crash in the Alps, 16 school children and two babies among 150 passengers and crew killed. It began to lose height on its approach to the Alps and crashed 10 minutes later. A helicopter search revealed the plane had crashed near the village of mirland Ravel around 95 miles northeast of Marseille. The wreckage was spread over several miles across this barren, desolate terrain, an area completely cut off from any roads. It became clear that all 150 people on board had lost their lives. Over 70 of the victims were from Germany including 16 school children returning from an exchange trip. 51 were from Spain and four from the UK. Paul Bramley, a student from Hull. Martin Matthews, a quality control manager from Wolverhampton. And Marion Bandres Lopez Bellio and her seven month old son from Manchester. In my experience of having helped many families who've lost loved ones in air disasters. One thing that has struck me is their, their grief and their anguish, a lot of it comes from the fact that the loss is so sudden. Um, you know, they've waved their husband or their wife or their parents or their child off at an airport. And of course they expect them to get 
often the other end. It's absolutely devastating. It's life-changing forever and overwhelming. And people move into a state of shock and disbelief, um, fear around what their loved one may have suffered. All the crew members were killed too, including the pilot and the co-pilot Andreas Lubitz. At first, he was only seen as another tragic victim. Initially, it was feared that there had been a mechanical failure, and questions were asked about the safety record of the Airbus 320, even though it is one of the most reliable planes in the industry. Modern airplanes, they don't fall apart in the sky. They just don't. There was another reason why I had some doubts about this possibility, and that was that the aircraft was was weirdly well behaved during the descent. It didn't go out of control. There were also suggestions that this could have been an act of terrorism. If suddenly a modern airliner disappears, you think things don't go wrong with airliners nowadays unless people intended. Maybe it was terrorism. The impact of the crash was so huge that hardly any of the plane's wreckage was recognizable. So the hunt began for the airplane's two black box flight recorders. One captures data on power, speed and altitude. The other records the actual sound on the flight deck. The hope was that the black boxes would solve the mystery of exactly what had happened. By Wednesday, one of the black boxes had been found, but no one could have foreseen how revealing and shocking its contents would be. The next day, the terrible truth began to emerge. The black box showed that co-pilot Andreas Lubitz had deliberately flown the plane into the ground. The French prosecutor broke the astonishing news. When the co-pilot was alone in charge of this plane, he used the flight monitoring system to make it start to descend. Selecting this option can only be done by choice. It would not happen automatically. So this is what we think actually happened. About half an hour into the flight, when the plane had reached its cruising altitude of 38,000 feet, the captain said to the co-pilot sitting in this chair that he needed to go to the bathroom for a toilet break. He tells Andreas Lubitz, you're now in control. And on the flight voice recorder, we can hear the cockpit door open and close. All alone in the cockpit, this is what Andreas Lubitz does next. First of all, he switches the cockpit door to lock. Then, he turns the altitude setting of the plane from 38,000 feet on the autopilot to 100 feet, like so. In order to set that course, he just pulls this out. With that simple action, he has set the aircraft and everyone on it on a rapid but controlled descent. A few minutes later, the captain comes out of the toilet and now wants to get back into the cockpit. So he rings the cockpit doorbell. But there's no response. So now he might try and ring it again a few times. He might also try to use the special code to get back into the cockpit. But this code doesn't work if the cockpit door has been set to lock by the man inside. Jim Tomini worked as a pilot for BMI and flew over 3,000 hours on an Airbus 320. Yes, sir. With the aid of a flight simulator, he talked me through the unexpected course that the plane took. As we know, the aircraft was put into um, a descent. Of course, the passengers at this stage, as the plane is descending, but they wouldn't have a clue what's going on. No. 
And in the beginning, the crew wouldn't have any idea what was going on either, right? Correct. We could just be changing flight levels, which does happen. The pilot will come back from the bathroom, he would knock on the door, there would be no response. Presumably a few minutes later, this will all get a bit more frantic. If I put myself into the position of being the captain, having entered the correct code, followed the correct procedure, there's no answer, I, I would allow a slight gap. It's entirely feasible that the captain assumed that the first officer was in the middle of a flight maneuver. Yeah. After, After that, a few minutes? Yes, you, you would certainly, having not been let in the first time, it changes from a request to be allowed into the flight deck into a command. Open the door now, let me in. If I was the captain, I would be screaming at the top of my lungs. And the passengers presumably would hear all that ruckus going on, wouldn't they? Yes, I would assume that the cabin crew would have drawn a curtain across in a vain effort to stop the passengers from seeing what was going on at the flight deck door. they hear it. Well, they would certainly hear what was going on. And here, we have silence. And we know that we could, they could hear him breathe, but he didn't say a word, apparently. Just silence. You can see on the um, secondary flight display, we're starting to get some areas of red, which is indicating this terrain is now above us. Would the co-pilots have known where exactly the point of impact would have been? Yes, you can see it here. That's getting critical now. It's getting dangerous. And we're travelling at what speed? We're just going through 270 knots, which is just under 300 miles an hour. Ah, shit. Terrain. That's a warning now. We need to do something. It's telling us that we're heading towards... Pull up. From, a, from a pilot's perspective, that's Pull up. something you never want to hear. And Pull that it, up. That's very difficult not to, to carry out the correct action. But he would have sat on his hands, Pull up. presumably. I'm, I'm guessing so. Pull up. That, that sends a shiver. I'm, Pull up. I'm, I'm, I'm having a cold flush as we speak. Terrain. 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 Okay, we're going to have to... Pull up. Pull up. had not done what you just did now, what would have happened? We would have impacted the ground. Immediately? Very shortly afterwards. Two days after the crash, the chief executive of Lufthansa faced the world's media. We at Lufthansa are stunned by the fact the plane seems to have been deliberately brought down, apparently by the co-pilot of the flight. As questions began to emerge about the company's training and selection of pilots, he was forced on the defensive. My firm confidence in the selection of our pilots, in the training of our pilots, in the qualification of our pilots, in the work of our pilots, has not been touched by this single tragedy. Meanwhile, the victims' families arrived by coach at the site of the crash. They were trying to come to terms with the discovery that their loved ones had died not in an accident, but in an act of mass murder. So far, none of the bodies has been recovered intact. The family of Paul Bramley, the Hull student, were also there. His father, Philip, tried to put his grief into words. If there was a motive or a reason, we do not want to hear it. It's not relevant. What is relevant is this should never happen again. My son and everyone on that plane should not be forgotten, ever. I don't want it to be forgotten, ever. Me and my family will visit here forever. I want to see this cloud over this town lifted and the natural beauty be restored and not to be remembered by the action of a single person. Thank you, my son, Paul. Lubitz's own parents also headed to the site but they were kept separate from the others. So who was Andreas Lubitz, and what had caused him to murder 150 people? The young man at the controls of this aircraft looks relaxed, happy-go-lucky even. It 
It's difficult to believe that he's the same man who flew a passenger plane into a French mountainside last week, killing himself and 149 others. So what kind of man was Andreas Lubitz? Over the last few days, we found out quite a lot about the man who's now become one of the most notorious mass murderers in aviation history. I've come to the place where he first learned to fly at the age of 14, the Westerwald Gliding Club. He was a very quiet, reserved man who behaved responsibly or gave the impression of behaving responsibly, just like most of the people who learn to glide here. It's so tragic and awful. The doubts that we have, and the fact that there is no explanation for this, and all the speculation that's doing the rounds, it's terrible. For Andreas Lubitz, being a pilot was much more than just having a job. It was a lifelong passion, a vocation, that he first indulged as a young teenager when he joined this place. But for him, flying gliders was just the start. In 2008, he moved on to powered aircraft when he began training as a commercial pilot at Lufthansa's flying schools first in Germany, and later in Arizona. And it was around this time that he began an on-off relationship with a school teacher. They shared an apartment in this block in the city of Düsseldorf. It's reported that she's expecting his child. When the loved ones of the crash victims prepared to travel to France last week, she intended to join them she said to have turned back when she learned the terrible truth of what Lubitz had done. Lubitz was born here, about 80 miles from Düsseldorf, in the town of Montabaur. Neighbours remember him as a polite young man who was also a fitness fanatic. And like everyone in Germany, they're stunned by what's happened. He was a young, healthy guy. He doesn't smoke. He uh, was active in sports. And he greets always when he's drinking by. There were no signs of sadness or depressions. Uh, I'm speechless that he did this, that he commits suicide and take 149 people with into death. I, I, can't, I can't imagine someone would do that. Only because he wants to kill himself. This is quintessential middle-class suburban Germany, a relatively affluent neighborhood. In this house, Andreas spent most of his life. This is where he grew up. In fact, he was still living here from time to time. His father is a manager in the local bank. His mother plays the organ in the local church. And yet, there was a darker side to Andreas concealed behind these shutters. The first hint of that came when Lufthansa revealed that he'd taken several months off for illness soon after he'd started flight training. It was reported that he'd suffered a bout of depression. One in four people suffer from depression. Depression comes in varying degrees of severity. There's mild depression, which is the most common depression, then moderate depression, and then very severe depression. People with severe depression tend to have suicidal thoughts when they're depressed. That's the group who need intervention and would definitely need a break from flying. But the German authorities believe his medical problems didn't stop when he went back to training after treatment. Last week, police searched his Dusseldorf flat and his parents' home for clues. What they found led them here, to the university clinic in Dusseldorf, one of the biggest hospitals in this part of Germany. We know that Lubitz came here on several occasions seeking medical help. And we know that the last time he did so, was on the 10th of March, just two weeks before the accident. We also know 
that the police found several sick notes in his apartment in Düsseldorf, which he had torn up, apparently, leading them to the conclusion that he had an ailment and he was trying to hide it from his employers. One of those sick notes, by the way, covered the very day that he flew the plane into a mountainside. Then another side to the life of Andreas Lubitz emerged. A flight attendant claimed that he was also having an affair with her. Her name hasn't been released, but she's been telling her story to the German press. She says she broke the relationship off because of the pilot's disturbing behavior. She said that he often had nightmares, night terrors, about crashing a plane. He was also really angry that he thought Lufthansa would never grant him his ultimate dream, his ultimate ambition, which was to fly long-haul flights as a captain. In other words, that his career was stalling. And then he also said to her, one day, and I quote, everyone will know my name. And two days ago, a bombshell. The German authorities announced that before Lubitz began training as a commercial pilot in 2008, there were fears that he might take his own life. He had, at that time, um, been in treatment of a psychotherapist because of what is documented as being suicidal. So how was Andreas Lubitz able to apply for a commercial pilot's license with a medical history like that? There are certain conditions that would totally exclude a pilot from going on and even starting training. These include a history of self-harming, suicidal thoughts and behavior, personality problems, bipolar disorder, neurological conditions, and several more. That would stop them entering flight school in the beginning. That relies on people being honest about their medical history. And Lubitz may not have told the truth when he applied to Lufthansa. It also means that he must have passed the psychological tests the airline puts all its applicants through. But once he started training here, Andreas Lubitz didn't mislead the company about his previous psychological problems for very long. Yesterday, Lufthansa revealed the astonishing news that Lubitz had actually told them about his depression. It happened in 2009, when he was attempting to get back into flight training after his illness. Lubitz emailed the Lufthansa flight school here and told them about a past serious depressive episode. He suffered depression at the time and he needed intervention for depression. So um, this automatically puts him at risk of developing another episode of depression at some point in his life. People who have suffered one episode of depression have a 50% chance of suffering depression again. If somebody suffers two episodes of depression, they have an 80% chance of suffering another episode again. So what this tells us is that he needed support um, to reduce the risk of relapse. The revelation that Lufthansa had been informed about Lubitz's serious depression has plunged the German national carrier, already reeling from the horror of this crash, into an even bigger crisis. Now, quite who in the company was privy to this information still isn't clear. But if a pilot with a medical history of psychological problems is allowed to fly, what precautions are there in place to keep the passengers safe? In a statement, Lufthansa said this. To ensure a swift and seamless clarification, Lufthansa, after further internal investigations, has submitted additional documents to the Dusseldorf Public Prosecutor. Lufthansa will continue to provide the investigating authorities with its full and unlimited support. Lufthansa, like all commercial airlines, regularly puts its pilots through rigorous testing. Here's the airfield. It's flown into a little bit of cloud. This simulator exposes pilots to the sort of high-stress scenarios they could face on a flight deck as their coordination and reflexes are pushed to the limit. Here around. No, keep going. 40. Start to ease back. Ease back. Ease back. Ease back. 
but simulators are not designed to reveal underlying psychological weaknesses in a pilot. Pilots do have annual medical checkups. These are the Civil Aviation Authority standards for performing them. Now, under the psychiatric heading, they say that the doctors should make a general inquiry about mental health, which may include mood, sleep and alcohol use. There are no mandatory psychiatric tests of any kind for most pilots. One former pilot believes the system places too much of a burden on air crews to decide whether they're safe to fly. I was having chronic and severe headaches that were debilitating. I knew that I was not fit to fly at the time. So I took the decision to remove myself from the roster and to report sick to, to my own aeromedical specialist. All I had to do was go to my doctor and say, I'm pretty much think I'm clear and I would have been back flying. And for me, that is not acceptable. The, the airlines trust the pilots to self-report and to self-diagnose to a huge extent. So if I'm about to lose my career if I report this, then the airline really has no way of knowing about that. Whatever Lubitz told the airline's flight school back in 2009, his company had no way of knowing what was in his mind when he took control of flight 4U9525 and locked the flight deck door. You're now in this cocoon at the sharp end of the aeroplane, in an environment that you're comfortable in. You know what all the switches and clocks and dials do, not many other people do. This is your office. So he would have been very consumed with ending his life and it, he was on mission to do that and unable to think at all about the consequences, unfortunately. He would have been fixated, staring ahead, uh, waiting for the moment of impact. He would have had to override all of the defenses and natural urges within him to save the aircraft, steer away from trouble. But by this point, things were doomed. He probably didn't even hear the banging on the door. He probably didn't even hear the, the intercom going off. All he knew was what he was doing, what was about to happen. I've come to meet a man with an astonishing story to tell. Hello, Brian. Brian Griffin used to be an airline pilot and he became obsessed with the idea of flying his plane into the ground with all the passengers on board. Like Andreas Lubitz, he also suffered from depression. Could you understand what might have been going through his mind? Uh, yes, because I'd had thoughts like that. My hand got the urge to go and cut off the fuel. Which would have meant crushing the plane? Yes, definitely. You would have died. Everyone would have died. Yes. I was in tears because I just couldn't understand what had happened to me. I couldn't escape from those uh, fuel cut-off levers. And the more you look at them, the more they look at you and say, touch me, I dare you to. And that's the way it is. It's... Um, there's something in your brain that you can't control. You know it's absolutely stupid, but um, you just can't control it. And how long did this go on for? Uh, for 18 months. For 18 months? And it got so bad that I was getting frightened when I put my uniform on in a hotel. In the last flight, I said, that's it, I'm getting off and I'm not going to get on the aeroplane again because I knew that the next takeoff I was going to do it. So you really think you could have crushed the plane? With no doubt. When it emerged that Andreas Lubitz had deliberately crashed his plane into the side of a mountain, the world was astonished that a pilot could commit mass murder. But Andreas Lubitz is not the only one to commit suicide by aircraft. Pilot suicide, as it's known, 
has a rare but disturbing history. At this stage, it does point to as pilot suicide, an incredibly rare event in aviation. There's probably half a dozen such cases in commercial flying over the last 25 years or so. Captain Su Wai Ming was a troubled pilot working for Asian carrier Silk Air. Su was facing financial, psychological and professional problems, but in December 1997, he captained Silk Air Flight 185 from Jakarta to Singapore with 104 passengers on board. Half an hour into the flight, the Boeing 737 plunged into a river, killing all aboard. US investigators concluded that Su destroyed the aircraft deliberately. Two years later, 59-year-old Jamil Albatuti, the co-pilot of an Egypt air flight from New York to Cairo, is believed to have crashed his plane into the Atlantic, killing 203 passengers. First officer Albatuti had allegedly been reprimanded and told he would not be flying the route again. The boss who had disciplined him was on board. But the US findings of pilot suicide are disputed by Indonesian and Egyptian authorities. But a pilot suicide in Africa just 18 months ago bears some eerie similarities to the German wings crash. On that occasion, the captain of Air Mozambique Flight 470 left the cockpit to go to the bathroom for a toilet break. After that, he tried to get back in. The co-pilot had locked the cockpit door and had set the plane on a course to crash for whatever reason. And one of the last things that can be heard on the flight voice recorder is the pilot of that plane desperately demanding entry back into the cockpit. On that occasion, 33 people died. The mystery surrounding the fate of Malaysian Airlines MH370, in which 239 people vanished over the South China Sea, is ongoing. But one line of inquiry for investigators is whether pilot Zahari Ahmad Shah, seen here checking in for his last flight, may have deliberately crashed the aircraft. If a pilot does decide to commit suicide from the cockpit, it's easier now than it was 15 years ago. Because of this day, 9-11, a cataclysmic event that changed aviation security forever. One thing the German wings crash has made alarmingly clear is that pilot suicide has become easier precisely because of the security regulations imposed in 2001. After 9-11, every airliner was forced to turn their cockpits into a virtual fortress. Uh, so far, this has meant that no terrorist has been able to turn an aircraft into a guided missile. But by solving one problem, the airline industry has created another. What if the killer is already inside the cockpit? After 9-11, 3,000 U.S. Federal Air Marshals were put on planes to protect passengers. Air Marshals were considered an essential barrier against a terrorist attack. For the first time, about 14 years ago, commercial airlines were used as human missiles. The regulatory and safety response to that in America was to make the cockpit a fortress. Airplanes nowadays, ever since 9-11, have had very different security measures on board. The most obvious one um, is the permanently locked cockpit door. In response to 9-11, international air safety regulators ordered that by 2003, all airliners were required to install new cockpit doors that could resist small arms fire and even a hand grenade. Cockpit doors now became impregnable. Furthermore, access to the cockpit was controlled by a complex system of locks and permissions. If the pilot locked the door, no terrorist could override the system. But like a Rubik's Cube, fixing one problem only created new problems for aviation security. Over in the professional circles of pilots and people with uh, statistical understanding and knowledge of, of safety and regulation looking at it in the long term, there was a quite keen debate about whether this was such a good idea. 
because it is always possible to imagine situations in which um, pilots can become incapacitated. There were some downsides, but the whole of the aviation industry and politicians everywhere who had to make the rules, they all looked at this and they said, look, 9-11, we know what 9-11 was. That could happen again if we don't do something. Four years later, the first major tragedy for which some blamed the locked door was Helios flight HCY-522 flying out of Cyprus, bound for Prague. The Helios-522 crash in 2005 uh, happened because the pilots had lost consciousness. If there hadn't been a locked armoured cockpit door there, it's quite possible that somebody from the cabin crew could have gone in time to be able to help them and revive them. If they'd been able to get to the cockpit, say, within five minutes or so of it being clear that the plane wasn't under the control of the captain and that they, if you, when they get on the interphone and find that there's no answer, if they'd been able to get through then very quickly, maybe they'd have been saved. Instead, the pilotless 737 flew into mountains near Athens, leaving no survivors. The official Greek inquiry into the accident blamed pilot error. But also in the report was the finding that a key problem had been communication between the cabin and the flight deck. The fortified door that hampered cabin crew helping the pilots was a factor in the Helios disaster. Another problem with the door is the risk of leaving pilots alone and unattended in the fortress-like cockpit. The joined up thinking from having made the cockpit a fortress was certainly that there should not be one person left unattended inside the cockpit at any time. And so in the United States, for over a decade, there has always been the two people in the cockpit at all times rule. So that if a pilot needs to leave the cockpit for whatever reason, then a flight attendant would be there and be on the inside of the fortress together with the other pilot. Some European carriers, such as Ryanair and Aer Lingus, adopted the same precaution. But most did not. For some reason, and we will find out why, um, the European airlines and regulators took a more lax view. Perhaps they thought it wouldn't happen to them. Why did Europe not do it? Because this sort of thing is incredibly rare. You don't take precautions against a risk that doesn't really exist or which is not reckoned to exist. Just 48 hours after the crash, EasyJet announced that it was changing its policy. Two flight crew would now need to be on deck at all times. Other carriers and the European regulator also followed. So you've now seen a rather late reaction by the European regulator, EASA, to say there must be two people in the cockpit at all times. That's very much after the event. They're closing the stable door on the horses in the next field, it really is. And 150 lives have been lost. In part four, we investigate how the business model of low-cost airlines affects the working conditions of its pilots. The whole idea in their model is they get the most out of their crews without breaking any rules and they get the most out of their airplanes. That's the reason why they're able to offer us low fares. Andreas Lubitz became a pilot in 2013. His dream was to captain long-haul flights for Lufthansa, one of the world's most prestigious airlines. But he took a flying role not with Lufthansa, but as a co-pilot with German Wings, its low-cost subsidiary. The arrival of low-cost carriers in the UK over 20 years ago started a revolution in the airline industry. Carriers like EasyJet and Flybe put the emphasis on value for money rather than luxury. Passengers could fly to parts of Europe for £9.99 pence or less, and they seem to love it. All the big carriers like British Airways, Air Canada or Alitalia have had to get a piece of the low-cost action. 
Without their own budget carriers, legacy airlines risk being undercut on some of the major tourist routes. And this in an industry with very tight profit margins. To keep their prices low, the low-cost carriers have had to run an exceptionally economical operation. There's no place for aircraft or staff standing idle. The whole idea in their model is they get the most out of their crews without breaking any rules and they get the most out of their airplanes. That's the reason why they're able to offer us low fares. For budget airlines, one of the most efficient parts of the operation is turning the planes around between flights. Southwest Airlines in the US, one of the first no-frill carriers, aimed for a 25-minute turnaround time, a benchmark since adopted by other budget airlines. But in order to keep to the tight schedules, once the plane lands, the pilots have to work very quickly to get it back into the air. Pilots have an awful lot to do during turnaround. They've got to think about the next route. They've got to program the flight computers with the weight that they're expecting the airplane to be because it varies on every flight. They're get, having to make sure the fuel that's necessary is being loaded. They've got lots to do. The quick turnarounds have made for an efficient service, but one former airline captain believes it's one of a number of practices that have made life more challenging for pilots. Pressure, power and yeah. fire. Operational pressures, I think, sums it up quite nicely. Yeah. They're under operational pressure to carry the least amount of fuel that they can, because that saves a lot of money. They're under operational pressure to turn the aircraft around in as short a time as possible, because that improves productivity for the crews on the aircraft. No, but no airline wants an aeroplane on the ground. It needs to be in the sky earning money. And many pilots believe these factors add to the stress of what is already a highly pressurized job. Yes, I, I do believe that the, the stressors placed on the crews of, of budget airlines, where the money lines are a lot tighter, are greater than those that work for legacy airlines or larger airlines. One of the other key changes championed by low-cost airlines has been the introduction of more flexible terms of employment. In 2015, the University of Ghent produced a report for the EU on the changing nature of pilots' contracts. In a survey of over 6,000 pilots, they found that 80% of those on temporary contracts flew for low-cost airlines. The report also found that a third of pilots flying for low-cost carriers were aged between 20 and 30, compared to only 1 in 10 pilots for other mainstream airlines and young pilots also sometimes face an uncertain future. In the airline industry, they've moved to temporary contracts, and so, um, you know, when people land their dream job, they don't know if, if they'll always have it. And this can create a lot of stress and insecurity. On the one hand, getting employed by a commercial airline is exciting, and it's, it's wonderful for a young pilot. However, um, what ensues is fear of job loss and fear of that contract terminating and it not being renewed, and I think that creates an enormous amount of stress. The European Low Fares Airline Association told us that safety is the prime focus for airlines and all airline pilots operating in Europe are subject to the same stringent requirements. Maximum flying hours are set and monitored by the industry regulator and are binding regardless of the business model. They added that many pilots opt to fly shorter flights because of the stability it provides in their working and family lives. But the crucial question is, have any of these working conditions made low-frill airlines any less safe? On their record, the answer is no. The Aviation Safety Network maintains records of any accidents on commercial airlines, but their research is endorsed by the Civil Aviation Authority. And their records show that since the late 1990s, the UK's low-cost carriers are just as safe as their more expensive counterparts. The airline industry has undergone momentous changes in the last few decades, but flying is still one of the safest modes of transport on the planet. On UK carriers, there is only one fatality for every 287 million passengers. That's compared to a 1 in 17,000 chance of dying in a road accident. All that will be a very little comfort to the relatives of the 150 people who lost their lives in this most brutal of acts.
Among these serene mountains in the Alps, the search for bodies may take weeks, and the search for answers may take even longer. Meanwhile, friends and relatives of the victims come together to mourn their tragic loss. Changes in the airline industry are already afoot, with cries for rapid action swelling. Although not all experts are in favor, many airlines have already adopted the policy, making it compulsory to have two people in the cockpit at any given time. Had an air hostess gone into the cockpit um, when the pilot came out, then when Lubitz locked the door, um, this air hostess would have been able to have unlocked it and let the pilot back in. Um, but also, having someone in proximity, some social support, actually helps depression, helps to alleviate, just lift the mood a little bit. It would have been much um, harder for him to carry out his actions. A lot of people have said, right, psychologically profiling pilots, you know, every, I don't know, month or something like that, you know. Be careful. We've got to be careful whatever we consider doing. Pilots have a fair amount of stress in their lives already, okay? They spend a lot of time away from their families. They have a demanding job. They're not allowed to get things wrong. They have an examination in their professional capacity every two years. That's enough stress, I think. You try and profile them too often. It could tip them over the edge. There is nothing in place now to protect a pilot that is suffering from extreme stress, be it domestic or operational, that would allow them to come clean, to seek the correct treatment, and to continue to operate safely, because they can. It's when it's bottled up, hidden, from the carrier, it just gets worse and worse and worse, and we've seen where that can end. And with mental health issues, things can change very rapidly. A happy pilot one day can be a seriously unhappy pilot the next. The girlfriend can leave, the wife can leave. Life throws SH1T at you. It happens to all of us, but most of us are not in safety critical jobs. So what should the airlines do to protect passengers from pilots going through temporary crises? I believe that the airlines need to tighten up on the way that they manage and monitor and even mentor their crews. Let's look at them as people with issues, with problems that need careful management. You want your crew to be a happy crew. You don't want a grumbly person who's always got a chip on his shoulder and find you and your loved ones, you know, all over the place, do you? As in the labor market, you know, in many sectors of industry, you know, there's a hell of a lot of pressure, you know, to to make things cost less, to make people work harder. Uh, and um, I don't think that's a necessarily a good thing, especially not in aircraft. There needs to be systems within airlines where peers look out for each other, like a band of brothers and sisters. That's the kind of thing you can do. You do the sensible, obvious, humane things. Good employers have good employees and happy ones. This wasn't, of course, the first time that a pilot has deliberately crashed a passenger plane. But it was the first time on such a scale right here on our doorstep. And it's undermined one of the most fundamental pillars of modern mass aviation. That bond of trust between the passengers and their pilots. Until that bond is fully restored, how safe can we feel?